uh, in the Sodom and Gomorrah story is actually an etiology. An etiology is an explanation of some form of cause or some point of origin for an otherwise naturally occurring phenomenon. Etiologies are found in folk tales and mythology around the world. They are stories that attempt to explain natural phenomena, like why the mountains exist, why the sky is blue, and why the wastelands of Israel look the way they do. According to etiology theory, the story of Lot and his wife was an attempt to explain the numerous strange salt formations near the Dead Sea. The area abounds with literal pillars of salt that stretch from a few inches to over six feet tall. At a certain time of day, from a certain angle, when the sun is just right, from a distance, these pillars of salt can look like there are people standing around on the, the shore of the Dead Sea. And so the story of Lot's wife being turned to a pillar of salt is most likely a legendary explanation for this naturally occurring phenomenon of salt pillars on the southern shore of the Dead Sea. Does the etiology theory explain the biblical mystery? Is the entire tale one long etiology that explains the origins of salt pillars, the vast expanse of empty desert around the Dead Sea, and a theological threat about wicked behavior? But what exactly was the wicked behavior that provoked God's wrath? The Bible itself never makes it clear. But the concept of sin is introduced when Lot moves from the country to the city. There is a bit of a culture clash going on between city life and the nomadic life within the Hebrew Bible. Cities are thought of in the Hebrew Bible as being places of sin. In the Hebrew Bible, much preference is given to a nomadic lifestyle, that is a lifestyle that depends solely on God for sustenance. The city that Lot moves to is no place for a righteous sheep herder. According to the Bible, Sodom is steeped in sin. The Bible doesn't tell us precisely what the sin of Sodom is, just that it was a very sinful city. But there are tantalizing hints. In Genesis 18 and 19, we do have men that come to visit Lot. And while they're there, men of the city want to come and have sex with them. Does this mean the sin of Sodom was homosexuality? Later generations were so certain of this that any unnatural sexual act was given the term sodomy. But in fact, the Bible never specifically states that Sodom's sin was sexual. Some suggest that the problem was more simple the urban citizens of Sodom were unkind to strangers. When strangers visit Lot, the Bible says the citizens of Sodom treated them badly. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is a lack of hospitality. These are people unwilling to share. They're unwilling to take care of a stranger, which is a very high biblical value. The early Hebrews were nomads who placed great value on sharing equally with other wanderers in the desert. These nomadic herders would have been astonished at the selfishness of city dwellers. But city was to support the story of Sodom. That's where the story stood for millennia, a tale of faith unprovable by science. But in the 20th century, archaeological breakthroughs began to provide startling evidence that the biblical tale may have some basis in fact. Buried beneath the floor of an ancient church lies a magnificent mosaic map with a literal trail that seems to lead to the lost city of Zoar and the ruins of Sodom itself. ruins of the Church of St. George lies an intricate mosaic map Built sometime in the 6th century CE, 
this beautiful work of art accurately reveals the lay of the land, showing the location of Jerusalem, Jericho, the Dead Sea, and in the southeast corner, an ancient name not seen anywhere besides the Bible, Zoar. It is the smallest of the biblical cities of the plain, the one city God did not destroy in the book of Genesis. At last, hard evidence that one of the biblical cities existed. In fact, the village exists to this day, known by its medieval name Safi. Only when the Madaba map was discovered did historians realize that the village of Safi was the ancient site of Zoar. And near the city on the ancient mosaic lay another tantalizing enigma, a partially obscured phrase written in Greek, the sanctuary of Saint Lot, or Holy Lot. Could this refer to the sanctuary of Lot during the destruction of Sodom? Archaeologists followed the trail laid out on the map, which led them directly to the ruins of an ancient church built in the 7th century CE. The tiles in the ruin directly label the church as the Sanctuary of Holy Lot. And archaeologists found one other fascinating detail. The church with a central nave and two aisles. One of the, the northern aisle has a small cave at the end of it. The cave seems to match the Bible's description of Lot's refuge, a hillside sanctuary outside the lost city of Zoar. This cave may not be the smoking gun that definitely proves the story of Lot, but it is tantalizing evidence. Two separate sources from the 7th century were interpreting this area as St. Lot's sanctuary, so at least they believe that Lot was living in this area, and this is very important. The fact that we have Middle Bronze occupation here, inside the cave, the fact that we have some burials outside, the fact that this site is only one kilometer to the northeast of Zoar, these all circumstantial evidence for people living here, and maybe Lot himself was living here. If the biblical story is correct, then the ruins of Sodom itself should be near the ruins of ancient Zoar. Archaeological teams came to the same conclusion with astonishing results. Since the 1970s, archaeologists have uncovered four different Bronze Age cities that eerily match the four cities the Bible says God destroyed with Sodom. And the city that corresponds most closely with the biblical city of Sodom is Bab Edra, on the shore of the Dead Sea, 50 miles from Jerusalem. In the Bronze Age, the period of the Bible's lot, Bab Edra was an independent walled city. We have cities surrounded by villages and agricultural land and so on, and every city was independent, so it was kind of city-state. Abedra, at its height, was home to 1,000 citizens. You study the artifacts in the houses, and you will start to think this was a kitchen, and this was a working area, and this was a reception hall, or whatever. The earliest archaeologists also made one disturbing discovery at Babedra. Mass graves. People were impressed by the number of the tombs here. According to different calculations, there were 20,000 people buried here. And for such small site, it's a huge graveyard. The earliest burials date from approximately 3,000 BCE. The enormous number of tombs suggested an ancient Sodom-like catastrophe and there is other tantalizing evidence of fiery destruction. During the archaeological excavation, there were some areas with ashes. 
In fact, the archaeological records show that at one point the city of Babad Ra was suddenly abandoned, its remnants lying untouched right where they fell until uncovered in recent decades. Babad Ra bears remarkable similarities to biblical Sodom, including its early Bronze Age remnants. But is it the literal city of Lot, destroyed by God's fiery wrath in the Bible? The key to connecting Babad Ra to biblical Sodom may lie in this small disk found 600 miles to the east in the ruins of ancient Nineveh. Hershey's Miniatures. Them really destroyed by fire from the sky, as the Bible claims, the secret to this mystery may lie here. In the storerooms of the venerable British Museum, in the collection of artifacts from the ancient Middle East, discovered in the mid-1800s, lies a small clay disc. The purpose of the disc is mysterious. It is an artifact of the ancient Sumerian culture that once flourished in what is now modern-day Iraq. Sumeria was the dominant culture of the early Bronze Age, from 3000 BCE to 2000 BCE, with major cities at Kish and Ur, and power stretching to the Mediterranean. The Sumerian disk is covered with ancient cuneiform that seems to be a chart of the night sky above ancient Sumeria. We know that he deals with astronomy because it has a number of constellation drawings which we can identify and because it has a lot of astronomical names that we know from other works. Among the recognizable constellations are Gemini, Pisces, and the planets Mercury and Jupiter. Astronomer Mark Himsel and engineer Alan Bond both found themselves intrigued with the Sumerian planisphere. They decided to attempt a translation by applying their expertise in astronomy and mechanical engineering. The translation slowly began to reveal that the ancient Sumerians were well versed in astronomy. It is a very sophisticated interpretation of the night sky, which shows that we're dealing with a professional astronomer who knows his trade and not just somebody who's looking at the night sky and guessing. Some of the features suggest that he was using instruments to measure angles and to observe things. We think that it's bowl-shaped because he probably had the wet clay he was writing on in a bowl in his hand. It's a sort of like a portable notebook. And he's recording things like clouds, position of planets, the sort of thing that an observer of the sky would be recording. But there is one sector that has remained mysterious since its discovery. The planisphere shows the region of Pisces and a uh, dotted line, for want of a better description, crossing the sky and it indicates an object which was quite alien in terms of their interpretation of it. The astronomer couldn't make out whether it was a star or a planet. Bond and Hemsel believed the translation could mean only one thing, an asteroid. The object would have first been seen in the constellation of Pisces, which he calls Apin. He then goes across the sky through Pegasus down to Aquila and then goes over the horizon. Meteorites and shooting stars move very, very quickly across the sky. However, in this case, the astronomer is seeing it when it is out in space. It's moving across the sky at the same sort of apparent speed as a high-flying aircraft. So he sees it for about four and a half minutes. In fact, the ancient astronomer is so exact in his details that the track of the object can actually be traced thousands of years later. That line across the sky is drawn against the star background accurately enough for us to plot the trajectory of the object. 
And it turns out if you run that trajectory backwards, it's uh, an asteroid of a type we know. It's in an orbit which is called an Aten orbit. Only in the 1970s did modern astronomers discover Aten-class asteroids, which orbit the sun between the Earth and Venus. They range in size from 100 feet across to over a mile. 